everybody, welcome. I'm very, very happy to see everyone here for our second Living with Wildlife seminar. And so for those of you who have not been to one of these things before, this is basically where we open up our Living with Wildlife class, um, which is one of our general education classes in the wildlife discipline. Um, we open that up and bring in special guest speakers and let everyone else come join us uh, to, hear, um, to hear what's going on with guest speakers um, from all over um, the all over the state and then sometimes from from beyond. Um, today we're, we've got a really special guest here that I'm going to let Dr. Hangstrom introduce in just a second um, and she's one of uh, very special to us because she's an alum um, so that's it's really fun for us to be able to bring her back here um, but I just want to point out a few things. Um, first of all for our students um, I just want to quickly remind you that you have a midterm that will open up uh, right after this lecture and there will be a test question or two from this lecture. So you might wanna pay special attention to Chanel so that you can make sure to get that question correct or those questions, I'm not sure yet. Um, so you can expect for that to open up, probably not right at five o'clock, but just <laughs> shortly thereafter, give me enough time to make that question or, or two and then I'll pop that in the exam and then it'll be available to you. Um, right now, your microphones are all, um, uh, disabled and that's because we're in this seminar here but if you have any questions that you would like to ask Chanel um, you can chat those in um, as we go along and then once we're done uh, we'll have some time where she'll be able to answer some of our questions um, and other than that I just want to say uh, welcome to everybody and I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing uh, hearing about our elk here in the state and um, I'm very happy to have everyone here so Dr. Hingstrom do you want to introduce our speaker? Yes, thank you, and, and uh, welcome to everyone joining us for this uh, Living with Wildlife seminar series that we have with the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, as well as with our Live with Wildlife course that uh, Dr. Sartini and I teach. Um, our guest speaker today is Chanel Bedleski, and uh, Chanel, as you've heard, is an alum of our wildlife program at UW-Stevens Point. Um, Chanel was one of those students, when she was here, she was everywhere. Uh, everyone got to know Chanel. She's very active in the student chapter of the Wildlife Society. She was involved in a research project with Dr. DeBay on uh, gape worm and ruffed grouse. Uh, she did an internship at uh, Navarino uh, uh, State Wildlife Management Area just east of Stevens Point and did very well there. And uh, hey, she graduated. Uh, she was able to move on and I'm not sure of the full path, uh, but I know Chanel was really interested in graduate school opportunities. She ended up landing a job with the uh, Missouri Department of uh, Conservation, working with one of my former students, Erin Hildreth, and she worked a lot on uh, deer and elk and big game species there in Missouri, until she kind of saw the light and found a way of getting back to Wisconsin. So <laughs> Chanel was able to apply for an assistant elk biologist position with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And uh, she landed that position and she's been working with the Wisconsin DNR in uh, Black River Falls now for uh, about a year, year and a half or something like that. Uh, Chanel and I have stayed in touch. We've talked about a variety of things and the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point is actually a partner in that uh, elk reintroduction program at, uh, at Black River Falls. And we've had a graduate student working there. Uh, Jennifer Summers, our program director, she's involved in a, a research project there uh, with the use of drones and the hazing elk out of crop fields. And so we still maintain a connection with the Wisconsin DNR and Chanel. And it's, it's really the pleasure to, to have her back. And really, we're looking forward to Chanel speaking on this topic of Wisconsin elk reintroduction and management. So thank you, Chanel. Yeah, thank you guys. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Just want to make sure. So my name is Chanel Budleski and um, Scott introduced me pretty well there. Um, graduated in 2018 at UWSP with wildlife and biology majors. And yeah, I've been over here with the Wisconsin DNR for about a year now with my position as an assistant wildlife biologist. Um, I focus on our Jackson County herd over here in Black River. And we'll kind of talk a little bit about both herds that we have in Wisconsin. We have Jackson County, and then we also have um, kind of the more famous herd is the Clam Lake herd. So we'll kind of touch on both of those. 
Um, I'm really excited to give you guys this presentation, even though it can't be in person. Um, this is a really good format that we're going to be able to work with. So I'm going to start by talking off um, with the elk reintroduction and just how that's gone the last hundred years or so. And then we'll start to get into what's happening in Jackson County um, and then also how we got our elk and what we do um, nowadays to just be around and focus on our elk herd at Jackson County. So, all right, so we'll get started here. Let's see, Is that flipping okay for you guys? Awesome. Okay, so a little bit about the history of Wisconsin elk. So elk were originally found in the 1800s across Wisconsin. You can see on the map um, above that the small dots are antlers or bones that were found by people and then reported. And then there's also literature references, those X's around the map um, that people have reported through publications and everything. So these animals were found a lot, surprisingly, uh, where Madison and Milwaukee now are, but this obviously was back in the 1800s. Um, so moving forward a little bit, um, back in the 1800s, the elk were actually overhunted. So that was leading to no elk in Wisconsin and kind of why we don't see a large population of them. And so then um, the states actually all around the United States decided they wanted to do an elk reintroduction effort. And this happened within 40 uh, plus states, Canadian provinces and Mexico as well. And so between about 1912 and 1967, um, about 13 to 14,000 elk were actually introduced from Yellowstone National Park. And these were used to establish herds around the US because not only were elk um, over hunted in Wisconsin, it was most every other state just because it's a big game animal. You can get a lot of meat. They're usually, they're similar to hunting deer. So if you know how to hunt deer, you can hunt elk pretty easily too. Um, so that's why this first reintroduction happened around the country. And so this is kind of a map showing um, the current and historic elk range. So the historic elk range um, shows that they're almost everywhere in the United States. And like I said, since they were overhunted, um, we had to do that reintroduction effort around you know, 40 plus states. And so now you can find a lot of smaller herds throughout the Midwest, a little bit in the East, um, but mostly everyone you can find out by like Rocky Mountain National Park, that kind of area out west, just because it's a little bit better habitat for them. And um, that's where they did thrive back um, in the 1800s. All right, so there are some benefits into uh, reintroducing a species to its native land. So the number one reason that elk were reintroduced into Wisconsin is because people wanted the return of that na or native species. So that's the main reason that Wisconsin decided to go through with this elk management plan of reintroducing them. And so there's also a few other benefits. Um, there's educational benefits promoted to elk. Recreational opportunities are a big bonus to a variety of different stakeholders. Tourism is a really um, big benefit that we have. So the elk bring a lot of people in from all over the nation to enjoy um, this native species and see what it's like in the wild instead of um, somewhere like a zoo or other places they'd be able to see them. And then as the older generation, well, as we're getting a little bit older, um, we're creating a lot of opportunities for future generations to enjoy and care for this species. All right, so Wisconsin originally had a reintroduction in uh, 1914, like we just talked about, and that was from Yellowstone. Um, by 1932, a lot of those elk were pretty much gone. So 15 elk were actually released in Vilas County and all of those elk um, from the 1914 and 1932 reintroductions, all of those were gone again by the 1950s. Now, a lot of this was just because there weren't enough animals to produce that population so that they could thrive within those areas. 
All right, so then, so there's a few different reintroductions that we have had. And so the second reintroduction effort actually happened um, around 1990. So the initial idea of elk reintroduction started with a legislator. And however, it took a while for the idea to actually take hold and catch off. Um, permission was granted to the UW Stevens Point to conduct the reintroduction as an experiment. So go UWSP. <laughs> And then after about five years, it was clear that elk could actually survive in northern uh, Wisconsin. And then at that point, the DNR was given management responsibilities of the herd. And so 25 elk were released in May of 1995, and those were acquired from Michigan. So that's our second reintroduction effort. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, our third reintroduction effort, which takes place from 2015 to 2019. And it's the one that uh, we've been working on just most recently. If you guys don't mind, I'm gonna take a sip here and there. All right. So now we're going to talk about the Jackson County reintroduction, which is uh, the herd that I actually work with out in Black River Falls. And so um, in 2000, local citizens approached the Jackson County Wildlife Fund, and they actually wanted to see more elk in the county since they were native to Wisconsin and uh, Jackson County originally. And then a habitat assessment was actually done to see where the high quality habitat for the elk um, would be the best. And so there's a large amount of public land, which is also a really big thing for um, reintroducing the species. You don't wanna reintroduce a species with a small amount of public land, and then they start going all around private land and causing a lot of damage and issues like that. So it's really important that we had that large amount of public land. And then you can see from the map um, that the habitat assessment that was done shows that Jackson County had really high suitability for having elk within that area. So that was also a plus. Um, and there was also a significant support uh, from the public with the assessment. And then Kentucky, hearing about this, actually became a willing donor for elk to be brought to um, Jackson County. And so there is also private funding that was secured, which also helped that reintroduction as a whole. And so I think this might happen within a few years, uh, the third reintroduction, but it actually took about 15 years um, of planning to get the third reintroduction off its feet. Because I'm not gonna go through all these bullet points, but as you see, there's a lot of agreements, a lot of rule changes, um, habitat product or projects, land acquisitions. There's a lot that goes into reintroducing the species. And with it being the third time uh, that Wisconsin was doing it, we wanted to make sure it was done right. And it was done um, according to the right legislator. All right, so now we'll talk a little bit about the translocation agreement that we had with Kentucky. And so um, we agreed with Kentucky that over five years from 2015 to 2019, we would be able to get 150 elk in total. So this was 50 elk per year that we'd be able to get. And those counted as cows, calves, and young bulls. And so the reason that we didn't have mature bulls in that was because um, they usually keep a harem. So they'll keep a group of uh, females together. And that creates a lot of issue when we're trying to commingle and all that kind of stuff once these animals are done with their quarantine time that they have. And so um, the, uh, we actually ended up trading grouse for elk to help Kentucky because they had a low um, grouse population. So we had a different agreement. I'm not gonna really get too much into that, uh, but we had a different agreement to help them out with the grouse since we helped, or they helped us with the elk. All right, so then the site selection for the Jackson County herd, um, 
like I said before, it had to be a lot of public land so that these elk wouldn't roam right into private lands and create issues. So we actually ended up having 250 square mile range that these elk, um, once they did disperse from certain groups, that they'd be able to um, have certain herds or split up in different herds, but not be creating any um, damage or any issues with the public around that area. Because a lot of people, they want the reintroduction effort to happen, but once you start getting those animals that are damaging your property or creating issues, then it becomes a really big issue. So that's why that was really important. You can see the map. Um, it's actually located near our Dyke 17 wildlife area out in the uh, Jackson County Forest. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about um, our site prep that we had for the elk coming in, as well as um, the efforts that it took in Kentucky for us to actually get the elk. So site prep, um, like I said, we had it over on the Dyke 17 wildlife area, which is about 15 to 20 miles um, from Black River Falls out uh, east. And so the site prep, obviously, a lot of tree removal, um, a lot of the planting and mowing. We wanted to make sure to have fields outside of um, the gated area so that once the elk were released, they would have a food source to go to. Um, so that would keep them there a little bit, but not too much where it would keep them there um, without dispersing. So then the, I may have a lot of pictures. Um, we'll kind of go through some pictures here and there. But um, this is kind of what the fenced in area looked like. And this is building a seven acre fenced in area and a monitoring area for um, health testing. And so now I'm going to touch a little bit on uh, the Kentucky elk capture and how we actually got those elk to uh, Wisconsin. So Kentucky is really unique because originally it was a mined area, which creates a lot of suitable habitat for elk. Um, so they would actually mine and then blow up certain areas that create a lot of hills and ridges. Um, and that's habitat that elk love. They love to be up in that hilly area um, and like mountainous terrain and everything. So uh, this is why it was really ideal for us to get elk translocated from here. All right, and now we're gonna talk, um, so there's two methods that happened. We used a trap and then we also used um, helicopter capture. I'll get into that part a little bit later. That's the more interesting part of it. But the trap setup, um, we actually use this in the winter time here at Black River Falls. So this um, we took from Kentucky. We got that idea from there and it's, really, really resourceful and it works really well. So this is our trap. Um, it's about a 12 foot high steel trap and these panels, um, if you can see here where they kind of bend, those link together. So we can make whatever shape we want, um, however big we want it. And so this is about the size of what they made in Kentucky. And so what happens here is, I'm actually gonna go back to this one. So you can see on the door, there's a small wire attached to a piece of wood. And so that's actually our trip line. So what happens is we have cameras set up all around the trap and then outside the trap. So we can see as the elk are coming in and we have a live feed from the camera. So we can see who's coming in um, and if we wanna collar them, if we wanna uh, you know, capture them, if there's a mature bull in there, Obviously we don't wanna capture that one because um, that's not in the agreement. And so what happens is once we get, let's say a group of 10 animals, um, cows and calves, we're able to actually call a number and that number trips the wire. So it opens up a little lever and it closes the door on the elk. So then those elk are stuck in the trap um, and obviously you're see, you're the one calling the number. So you get out there as soon as you can um, and then you're moving these animals into a trailer. So we'll kind of look a few pictures here. So these are the cameras that we set up. Like I said, they're live feed. Um, might be about a 30 second delay sometimes. So you really have to be on top of your game when you're ready to close that door. 
And this is what they look like when they're in there. And so then transporting the elk um, with this method, what you do is you back a trailer right up to the trap. And like I said, how those panels, you can kind of move them around. Um, we open those panels and we put them to the side of the um, trailer. And then the elk usually go pretty well in the trailer. They actually work really well um, on long transports and everything. They're a pretty calm animal to deal with despite their size, so. All right, and so this is the other method that we used. Um, this is a private helicopter crew that was hired for the first um, or for uh, the last year or two. And what they did is they came uh, in the helicopter and they actually rocket netted the elk. So when they saw an elk, they'd fly low enough. A guy would shoot with a rocket net and then he would go out and hog tie. So he'd tie the legs together and put a blindfold on it. And then what happens is they get that um, security bag that the elk is in, you can see in the picture above, and they put the elk in that, wrap it around. And then what happens is they got transported right over to the trailer. So this is a really fast method at getting a lot of elk because you're not necessarily waiting for them to walk into a trap. Um, a lot of times it's not a guarantee that you'll get you know, a handful of elk within that trap. So this helicopter method is really, really good at getting your numbers and getting being able to target what you want. So if you have a lot of cows, you can target young bulls a little bit more. Um, the issue with this is that it's really expensive. So um, if you have the money to do it, it definitely is the better way to go. Um, but if you're, you know, don't have as much for the finances um, on the effort, then it would be better to go with that trap. All right, so then that elk, um, you can see that uh, harness blanket is still over it. So what they do is they put it on the trailer, they do an ear tag, um, they'll put a collar on a lot of times and just a few identification um, things that go on the elk. They'll actually get a pit tag too. So you can scan over the elk in, in case it loses its collar or the ear tag and you still have that animal identified with a certain number. All right, and these are just a few pictures, elk being loaded. And then here's the elk uh, in the trailers. And like I said, they're pretty calm and easygoing. Um, so they're usually not too many issues. And we like to separate them to just a few elk per panel in that trailer. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the Kentucky quarantine as well as the Wisconsin. Um, so there's 120 day quarantine in total for the animals. And uh, this requires a lot of testing in both states uh, for CWD, TB, a lot of different diseases because we wanted to bring that disease free donor to Wisconsin. We don't want to bring any other diseases that we already have over here. Um, also had required health testing for the animals in Kentucky and Wisconsin, uh, and they were pre-tested before they went into the pens um, in both areas. And like I said, those pens are 10 foot uh, high fences and they're double fenced in both of the quarantine areas. And there's a solid barrier. So I'll show you there's a black fabric that goes over that fence. And that just creates the animals from getting spooked by any predators or from uh, trying to run through the fence, whatever it is. Um, so that just keeps them a little bit more safe. All right, so we're going to talk about the Kentucky quarantine facility. So both facilities um, were about the same. The quarantine for Kentucky was 45 days. And so we kind of went around um, all the health testing and everything. But here's a few pictures that you can see. They also did um, a general health assessment and a pregnancy test on uh, cows and calves. So depending on. Um, if they knew or not. And so then we get back into that transporting that we talked about. So we had quite a few trailers um, going at once. Usually we'd, we would have people 
from Wisconsin, bring the trailers over, and then it'd be about a 12 hour drive back. And uh, once those animals were okayed from that Kentucky quarantine, and then they go directly into the Wisconsin uh, quarantine. All right, so this is what uh, our fenced in area looks like. Seven acres, you got three different areas, um, cows, calves, and then the young bulls. And then once the animals actually got done with all their testing and getting their collars and everything on, um, there were doors in between. You can't really see it on the picture, um, but we opened those so that the animals could commingle with each other before they were released. All right. So just a few cool pictures here. And then there's that black fabric um, that's covering the fencing all around. And then we also had um, an area where someone would sit 24 hours a day watching and making sure that there are no issues with the animals. Here's a few cool pictures. So a lot of animals, if they were pregnant, um, obviously that quarantine is 120 days and so a lot of animals would um, give birth to a calf and so that's how a lot of our numbers later on that I'll show you actually went up from getting 50 elk to 60 so and so then um, once all the elk were in the pen area Usually what people would do, the DNR staff, is we would get in and put your arms at length and you would try to funnel the animals into the health lab facility that we had. And so um, we'll show a few different pictures on this, but there's eight different corridors for this. And so obviously they're getting funneled in and um, each corridor is gonna give you less elk. So once you get to that eighth corridor, that's where you have one elk and you're working on the health testing. So they're slowly separated from each other. And then there's that uh, panel eight and that panel eight has a weight in it uh, that they step on so you can get that weight. So you can see that in the picture. And then this is actually a hydraulic system that holds the animal into place um, without creating any issues rather than having a muzzle or hold them at a certain uh, degree. So this is just a lot safer for the animal and the testers. And so here's our state wildlife vet. She's attaching um, ear tags to the animal, as well as that pit tag that we talked about where um, you can scan on the back of the neck and that gives you an identification number. And then um, the collar as well with any other health testing things that they need. All right, and so this is what they look like when they're done with all their testing and everything. They got their two ear tags, collar, pit tag. Uh, they might have had blood taken, just kind of depends on what that specific animal needed. And then, like I said, those gates that we had in between the three um, areas of the pen, this is where they were opened and the animals are finally able to commingle with each other. And there's, there's 112, she's our troublemaker still. All right. And then um, once they were over with that 120 day quarantine in total, they were released from the back of the pen. Um, and so usually the animals would stick around and they would stay on this planted field that we had. Um, but then we actually ended up having a little bit of an issue where the animals felt really safe in that area. And so they wanted to keep coming back into uh, the fenced in area. Obviously we don't want that because of predators and them getting trapped um, and they just need to separate a little bit and create their own herds. So we had um, a lot of issues with that. So a separate gate was actually put up so they couldn't get back in. Um, once that was put back up, they started to disperse a little bit more, so. All right, so we're gonna go a little bit here into the capture summary. Um, so year one, what these numbers are is it's showing you how many elk we got from Kentucky. So year one, 26, 39, uh, 28, and 48. 
And then those numbers, how it went 26 to 23, obviously there are some mortalities that do happen, um, like in the first year. And then the second year we actually went up. And so there are a lot of births that happened as well. Um, within that amount of time that we captured the animals in Kentucky and the time that they were released in Wisconsin. So in total, how I was talking about earlier, we had that agreement, that translocation agreement with Kentucky, and they said 150 elk, 50 elk a year you can have. We ended up with 141, um, but by the time we were done with the births and mortalities and all that stuff, we ended up with 164. All right, so now I'm going to talk just a little bit about our current management efforts. Um, so we have continued, continued monitoring and research. A lot of what I do for my job is telemetry. So I go out and I check on the animals' collars, make sure they're working, um, make sure everyone's still alive and doing well. Uh, that's, like I said, that's a majority of what I do um, on a weekly basis is checking on those animals. And I actually ended up getting two dropped collars last week. So I have to go in and find that collar kind of in the middle of nowhere, um, listening to a bunch of beeps and everything, and then pick those up and you cross them off the um, list that you have until you can get them in the winter and recollar them. And so then there's a lot of habitat uh, improvement, like prescribed burns that we have. Um, we have planting here and there in certain areas for the elk that are happening, uh, whether it be us or volunteers that we have with Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, uh, Jackson County Wildlife Fund. We have a lot of people that like to help with that on their private properties, which is awesome to see. And then we also have a lot of uh, conflict management. So. A big thing that we work on here is elk being around cranberry bogs. And so they like to get into those vines uh, that the cranberries grow on and they rip them out and they cause a lot of issues with um, our private landowners because once that vine is ripped out from the bog, you can't go back. If there's cranberries taken off of it, it's fine. But once the vine is ripped out of the ground, um, it creates a lot more damage. And then we also do a lot of outreach and education. So presentations like this, which is great to be doing, especially during COVID. Um, we have a school forest in Black River, which introduces a lot of younger kids to different kinds of wildlife. Um, so a lot of different age groups that we have. Excuse me here. All right, and so I'm gonna talk about our calf collaring that we have. Unfortunately, we are only able to do it a little bit this year just due to COVID. Um, but in most years, what we have is we have a really big volunteer sign up list. So if you're really interested in calf collaring, you can message me after this and I'll put you on the list for next year. It's during the summer. But it's really, really good um, hands on experience to figure out, you know, the kind of species that you want to work with or whatever it is. And just in general, it's pretty cool to do. So what we do is we get a group of people together. And once we see, so mom has a GPS collar and we get that GPS location every 13 hours from an online database that we have. And then once mom starts to home in on a certain area within a few of those 13 hours, we know she's about to give birth. So what we do is we go out, take a group, find mom's location and then we just start walking and we walk um, arm's length or a little bit more depending on the terrain and we go and look for the calf and once we find that calf they get um, collared and they get blood drawn sometimes depending on uh, what's going on they get a pit tag and ear tag so it's all a really exciting experience to be a part of. So like I said, let me know if you're interested in that because we can get you on the list. So winter capture is one of our busiest um, parts of the season. And so what we do here is we're working on getting new GPS collars, um, you know, whether it's the collars aren't working anymore um, or our younger animals have grown out of their VHF collars, which don't give you a lo GPS location. 
that's where you have to go in and use telemetry. And you can usually hear within a few miles of them. Um, so once they get old enough, they get a GPS collar because the VHF collar, the one that calves have, that has a breakaway. So once they start growing, it breaks off of them. And that's like when I was talking about that dropped collar, that's what happened is it broke off of those elk. And so you have to go back and retrieve it. And then for this winter, that just means that that elk will get a GPS collar now if it's over a year and a half. So that's what we do with winter capture. We do uh, that same trap, same method. Um, and we usually have a lot of volunteers too. So also if you're in the Black River area and you're interested in helping with this, that's a pretty cool opportunity too. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the population growth here not too much. Um, so you can see that towards the winter, numbers start to go down due to a uh, low number of food and uh, a lot more predators, that kind of thing. Um, elk are a little more susceptible in the winter because they're not eating as much. And then once you get to the summer, we start to get more animals um, that are born. And so with that, our numbers go up. So it's kind of a little bit of a uh, scheme here. All right, and then I'm just gonna kind of show you guys this mortality is, um, this is just for the Jackson County area. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is just for the Jackson County area. Um, so our biggest thing that we have is um, Usually vehicle collisions outweigh our wolf predations. It's just that we had a few wolf predations um, this year. But since we are near an interstate, we unfortunately do have a lot of animals that end up over there and they do end up getting hit. So yeah, so we've had a total of 48 mortalities since 2015. So we're doing pretty good so far. All right, and this is just um, some of our partners and everything and the estimated cost of what um, this all, the reintroduction effort cost. Um, and so UWSP, really, really big part of this. Um, and we had Jackson County Wildlife Fund, uh, as well as, you know, everyone in this picture. So, you know, if you don't have partners or different stakeholders to work with, um, it's really hard to do a project like this. So it's really great to have a lot of different um, views and um, just get a lot of input on all of this. All right, so that is about it for me. Um, if we have questions, we can move into that. Otherwise, feel free to contact me too at this information. Awesome, thank you so much, Chanel. Um, this was, I, I, I love, I feel like I could watch you do this a, a million times. I love seeing <laughs> the pictures. I love hearing the story. I think the story of elk in Wisconsin is just really, it's fascinating, I think. Um, so thank you for sharing it with us. Yeah, Actually, thanks for having me. Yeah, um, I don't think you were looking at the chat as you were going, which is good, but we've got a right. bunch of questions for you so far, if you don't Perfect. mind. What, what I think we might do is if I'll go to the top where the first <laughs> question was asked and we'll just kind of go down the line. So Perfect. if you if you all haven't um, typed in a question and you think of something now, uh, go ahead and um, and chat it in. Um, we'll go for about another ten or fifteen minutes, and then um, we'll see if we can exhaust the number of questions that we that we can come up with. We'll, we'll really put Chanel to the test here. Sound good? Yes, that sounds great. Okay, good deal. All right. So um, our first question is about um, when the original elk populations were reintroduced. Those, for those first few reintroductions, you said that um, animals were put on the landscape and then um, those populations declined. And the question is whether there was any um, hunting that was part of that. So was hunting implicated in that at all or was that a natural decline in the population? Right, so hunting was um, a part of that. It wasn't, there weren't really laws or anything stuck in stone for the first reintroduction. Um, so yeah, hunting was a really big part of that as well as the animals, um, you know, not, not many animals being able to create that full population, so. 
Okay, so a combination effort, right? Yeah, Not putting yep. enough in to begin with, and then um, and then hunting, like unregulated hunting. Exactly. Yep. And then once we started to get more into the second reintroduction and third, you know, obviously there are a lot more um, regulations that were put into the place, especially obviously the third, because that was in 2015. But the second, yeah, they started to get more regulations into place. So. Okay. And this wasn't a question that was asked, but just to clarify for, mm -hmm. for people who are in here right now, we're only hunting elk that are in the clam leak herd correct yes yes so there's only the clam lake herd and that is actually done by a lottery system so people can pay um ten dollars for an entry in it and that's put into a big pot and then there's 10 different people that are um, picked from there and so um I believe it's five Ho-Chunk Nation since they put into a lot of our reintroduction efforts. Um, one is Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation because they also help us. Um, it, they're a really big part of this. And then four is a Wisconsin resident. So, but hopefully we should be um, getting a few more here within the next two years, maybe starting something up in Jackson County, but not sure on that. It's just going to depend on our, our numbers and everything. Okay, good deal. Mm -hmm. um, so just not there yet with Jackson County. Yeah, yeah, we're only, so we're only about 100 animals or so right now. Um, and Clam Lake is probably closer to 300, a little okay. over 300, so. Okay, good deal. Plenty of time for that, right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> good. Okay, our next question is about getting elk from different regions or states and how that affects the survival of the animals that we receive. Um, so how do you choose kind of where they come from and how does and does that affect the survival of the animals once they're here. Right. So elk are a really viable species. They can move um, to a lot of different places and adjust really, really easily. Um, so for instance, we have elk here in Wisconsin and the climate can get pretty cold. Whereas when I worked in Missouri, um, the climate was a lot warmer than what it gets, especially in the summer. So elk are able to acclimate a lot better to different areas, which um, doesn't really affect their survivability. I guess it also depends, though, how many elk you have within that area. Um, so if you have a large herd or um, a smaller herd, it's going to it's going to kind of depend on that, like how we talked about the first reintroduction effort, um, how they were hunted. But there also weren't a lot of elk to actually keep them going. So. Okay, so hopefully that answered it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, it, if that doesn't answer it, you can retype uh, or clarify right. your question a little bit. <laughs> what I think I heard there is that it doesn't matter so much on the receiver's end where they come from because they are, right. uh, they can tolerate a pretty wide range of conditions, but exactly more to do with picking a healthy population for the source so that you don't damage the source population. Yep, exactly. Okay, good deal. I might just add to that, uh, Chanel showed a map that uh, had the distribution of elk across the United States, and you notice there are several populations of elk in the eastern U.S. that were extirpated at one time, and so various state agencies have been shipping elk all over the country for decades, and they've done really quite well. They're, mm -hmm. as Chanel said, they're, they're a pretty robust species. They can take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. They're, they're starting to see that in North Carolina where I'm from too. It's so, it's so fun to see. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, next question has to do with elk damage. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of damage to private property do elk cause? And I think you touched on it a little bit. I think there's another question about cranberries. Right. Um, so um, do you see any like friction between, you know, um, the elk population and then maybe private landowners? Yeah, so we have had um, quite a few handful of issues that have come up. Um, one of them was a cornfield that we had. We had a few bigger cornfields um, that's actually under one guy's property. And so um, he ended up having to put over a fence around the area so that the elk would stay out of that area because they were creating a lot of damage there. Um, it was an open area for them free food, you know, it's kind of what they want to find. Uh, but obviously that private landowner didn't want them there. So the uh, route that they took is putting up a really, it's about a 10 to 12 foot high fence around that property. 
And usually a lot of the times the DNR will pay for part of that if it is due to the elk damage and everything. And then um, the cranberry bogs as well, I would say something that we kind of talked about before, um, but they create a lot of issues within there as well. Um, not necessarily eating the cranberries, but especially during rut, um, the bulls like to rub their antlers on a lot of things, uh, get the velvet off, that kind of thing. So that's more the kind of damage that they're creating. And obviously if you're getting a lot of elk, uh, you know, 500 pound, 700 pound animals uh, walking through a cranberry bog, that's gonna create a lot of erosion and everything in that area too. So okay. yes, a lot of, lot of damage like that. Yeah, so I know there's a follow-up question about this. Do you mind just touching quickly on um, how you deal with the damage in cranberry? Like, what do you think right now is the best way to deal with damage to cranberries? Right, so actually um, working with Jennifer and Scott right now um, and we're using a drone. And so I don't know if Jennifer or Scott wants to talk a little bit more about that, um, but we're hopefully using that as a hazing tool. So hopefully um, once those elk do come onto the bog that drone can be used to haze them off of it. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay, so using a drone. So once, yeah. once the animals are spotted, then the drone comes in and just basically scares them off. Yeah, and we haven't had too many chances to do that. We've only had a few last year, but hopefully we'll be able to get a few more in here um, within the next month or so. So yeah, so we'll do that. Um, another way that I worked on them last year is helping out because they usually would come around later at night. Um, and we drive around the bog about every hour for probably four to five hours at night and we have pyrotechnics so we have bird bangers screamers all that kind of stuff and we'll go around and we'll shoot them off randomly but if we do see an elk we will shoot it off not at them but within that obviously we don't want to do that um but within that area to scare them off um and then a lot a lot of times too what we tell our landowners is to get um a cannon where it's a propane tank and it shoots off a loud thing of air every hour or so um and that usually that noise will keep the animals away so that, that's a few methods that we use to um get them out of the area otherwise we had this summer too um we had those bird bangers and everything and as we use it in the calf searching where we're walking you know arm to arm we'll walk through a cornfield arm to arm with our bird bangers and hopefully scare something up and push it directly out of there so yeah hopefully that answered yeah, I think why well, we'll see yeah. if anybody has any follow up <laughs> questions. Just the more I think from from watching your the the pictures and everything, and then also the description of the pyrotechnics and stuff, I feel like if there are any undecided students in here, you should no longer be undecided by the end of this, and you should all decide that you would like to be a wildlife biology major. That's just it, my it is pretty. It's fun. Yeah, it gets you outside <laughs> too. So <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> Um, we've got a few more questions if you're still, if you're still yeah. good. Yeah, okay. no problem. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so this is about elk that are seen farther and farther south. And I think in particular, there's been one individual in um, Grant County, but then also some that have been showing up in Juneau County. So is that a indication that the Black River Falls population is growing? Or do you think that some of those animals might be like uh, escaped captive individuals or... Right. So a lot of times what that is, is it's young bulls. And um, once the mature bulls have their harems and everything, those young bulls will come in and try to fight for one of those females. But then more than likely, they're going to get pushed out because they're too small. So then those animals are going to keep going until they find another mate um, or until they find another herd. So a lot of times what that is, is it's just a single young bull that's um, out looking for a mate. Okay, so just yep. dispersing individuals, but yep. mainly young males. Yep, it's usually young males. And we had one, um, I think it was Southwest or Southeast Portage County um, that I talked to you all about and that one was a young bull that was dispersing as well. And we had um, 
one, it was actually funny because I just came back from Missouri um, and the elk biologist, Aaron Hildreth, that was Scott's old student, uh, called me up and he's like, you guys, are you losing an elk or something? We got one of yours down here in Missouri. So that was just one of our bulls. Um, that was a really long move for a young bull, but it's not the you know longest that we've captured before. So that's just them looking for a mate. Okay. Just got to keep going until you just, find one, Just right? keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, they don't know there's not really many around, but yeah, they'll keep going. So okay. good to know. Good to know. Mm -hmm. um, next question is about genetics. So when you're doing reintroductions, how much attention do you have to pay to genetics and what kind of concerns do you have related to that? Right. And so what we're doing is a lot of those animals um, that we had, we had the 150 uh, for actually Jackson County and then Clam Lake. So those animals will get separated each year and they'll go to different herds. Um, what we're working on right now is we're doing an assisted dispersal. So that's why we built a two acre pen. And what we're going to do is we have two separate herds. So we call them the Wazee Lake herd because that's where they hang out. And then we also have a high Highway O herd. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take um, a number of individuals from the Highway O and we're going to move them north a bit so they can start their own area. And then with that, once more animals are born, we're going to move those into the different herds. So we're trying to move the population around a little bit so that we don't have that uh, genetic issue. Um, as of right now, since those animals were wild uh, before, we don't really have too much of an issue with it. Okay. So they weren't all bred in one area. They were wild in Kentucky, uh, but we do pay, we did pay attention during that reintroduction effort to make sure that those animals were being separated a little bit, so. Okay, so uh, trying to kind of speed up dispersal and move things around on your own. Right, right. Yep, and that's why we have that two acre pen like I talked about. And so what we're going to do this winter when we're doing that winter capture is you get some animals that are in that group, um, like the Highway O group, and you put them in a trailer and we move them up to that pen. And then once we start to get maybe like 20 to 30 individuals, you keep them in that acclimation pen for about probably a month or so and then they can be released together so that they will hopefully stay together and they won't disperse again um but yeah so now every year it might be adding to certain areas or switching some animals up and everything so that we don't um have to deal with you know genetics same genetics in the same area okay okay and you just also added some kentucky animals to the clam lake population recently as well too right right Yep. So those, so the um, clam lake, those are good as well. They'll have that um, genetic variation in there as well. Okay. Good deal. Um, all right. Next question, since you're still doing well, is about COVID. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, you got it. This is an interesting topic. Um, so the question is whether COVID has had any impact on uh, elk reintroduction or survival. Um, so I, you know, not that we know of, but like I said, we weren't able to do that calf capture um, this summer. So we weren't exactly sure on our numbers that we have. We have had, uh, you know, camera pictures come in that show, you know, eight newborn calves, that kind of thing. Um, but I would say that's really the only thing that COVID affected was us being able to collar those younger animals. Um, hopefully it's not gonna affect us for this winter season so that we can put collars on those animals and just track um, their survival and uh, where, they're, where they're going, their movement. So, okay, so far so, so good, but. <laughs> right, so yeah. it's not a matter of um, COVID having an impact on the elk, it's just a matter of COVID having an impact on us knowing how the elk are doing. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Just kind of restricting what we can actually do out in the field right now. So, but it's opened up a lot more um, since we had the start in like March. So I back um, back in March for the first three months or so, we weren't able to, to do telemetry because we were trying to figure out the whole COVID thing. Um, but now we have certain regulations in place. So, okay. Yeah. Good, yeah. good deal. Good deal. Mm -hmm. um, next question is about CWD. Have you ever yeah. seen CWD in elk um, either in Black River Falls or in Clam Lake? 
Um, you know what? That is not a question I have been asked before. So (laughs) yeah, yeah, that is not a question I have been asked before. Um, I don't believe in the Jackson herd. We have had, we haven't seen CWD. I know that the clam lake herd, I'm not sure of just because I don't work directly with that herd. Um, so if, um, yeah, if we're interested in that, that's something I can ask our main biologist. Jackson County, though, no. Okay, so not in Jackson County, but we, yeah. but we have to check. Clam Lake, I don't believe so, because if there were in Clam Lake, we would have um, some more regulations that would have to be put in place that I would assume would be here, too. Um, but that is something I can look into if we're interested in that. I can write that down. Yeah, I think that I think that'd be good to know. I mean, I, yeah. it seems to me like if that were a thing, you would know it, I, right? Yeah, but that's a that's an interesting question. Yeah, no one's asked me that question before. <laughs> Usually, it's just related to the reintroduction. And I'm like, yeah, that's totally fine. Wow, that's so stumped funny. me on that one a little bit. <laughs> so funny. I was in an elk committee meeting uh, for the DNR in April, and as of that time, there had been no uh, CWD instances occurred uh, or reported in elk in Wisconsin, fortunately, but it does occur in other states. Colorado, you know, they've had it for a long time in elk. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, thanks, Scott. (laughs) (laughs) I assumed Uh, he would know, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, it's coming up on five o'clock. It's 4.57. So I just want to say to everyone, um, we can still run through some of these questions, but I understand if you all have to go. Um, please feel free to, to do so. Um, and just a quick announcement that following this is um, the presentation um, and the Wildlife Society with, with um, Janelle Sharhag, who's going to be sharing her experiences in Hawaii as, a, um, as an airport biologist there, actually. I think she's got some pretty cool stories to tell us about her work in Hawaii. So for uh, students of mine and living with wildlife, you can find the link to that um, TWS meeting. Um, in the announcements on Canvas. Um, for anyone else who would like a link to that, I'm sure that Brylin would be willing to chat it in for us here. Um, so, um, Chanel, if you ha- do you have a few more minutes to keep? Yeah, I have plenty of time. <laughs> okay, look at yeah. her. She's a lot of tougher. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll just keep going um, and answer a few more here then. Um, actually, this one, this next one is one um, from one of our students, Dan, that I actually was wondering as well. Mm-hmm. So in your mortality, here he is, um, in, <laughs> in your um, list of mortalities, you had two euthanizations, I think it was. Is that what yeah. you were looking at, Dan, those two euthanizations? Why Let do you have to euthanize to animals? Like what, what were those cases? Right. So there could be, I'm not sure on the exact cases. Um, that happened because those happened quite a few years ago. Um, A lot of times what can happen is if an animal is injured, um, I do, I do believe one that we actually had now that I'm thinking of it, um, an animal, she was going through two trees and there's the trunk um, and the trees kind of split up like this uh, and she got stuck in there. And so obviously then she was getting um, kind of attacked by predators and stuff and she ended up having to be euthanized. I know that um, a lot of times what happens is the animal just gets hurt and it's um, protocol for us to euthanize it. Okay, so it would have been a natural mortality, but um, right. But you right. just don't let it be a natural mortality, and you go ahead and choose to humanely euthanize. Right, exactly. I'm not sure on the exact cases um, for the other one, but yeah, that's usually the protocol that we have. If an animal is suffering, uh, you want to euthanize it as soon as you can. Okay. If, yeah, as long as there's no other way. Um, but usually, like, if an elk breaks its legs, there is unfortunately no coming back from that. Um, there's not really too much we can do with a wild animal and broken legs. So uh, that would be a euthanization. Okay. Um, does that answer your question, Dan? Since I can see you. <laughs> kind of. You can chat it in. Yeah. Like, think about it, chat it in, and we'll, we'll circle back to the euthanization question. Um, so the next thing is about um, whether there's a date set for volunteering. For, I think there's a lot of excitement. When you were saying, oh, do you want to do <laughs> searches? I was like, do I? Yes, I do. Uh, yeah. Um, how do people find more information about that? And is there a date set already or Great. not? 
Right. So usually what happens, and it's it's all going to unfortunately depend on the COVID um, issue that's going around. Usually in May of whatever year we're in, so like next year, May, um, it's on Facebook, it's on the DNR page. They try to publicize it as much as they can, that you can do calf searches and who to contact. So they'll put the contact info on there. Um, if you do send me your information, if you are interested from this presentation and you shoot me your name and email and contact info, um, I can add you on the list that will, you'll be called next year already. So um, you'll be kind of ahead of the game. But yeah, so usually it's um, a lot of social media platforms um, and that kind of stuff. I don't know um, just because this year we ended up not having volunteers because of COVID. So like I said it's going to kind of depend on that but usually when it does happen um is end of may through june and sometimes early july so yeah so honestly whenever through the winter now anytime uh if, if someone says they're interested i'll just add them to a list that will call them that uh following me okay okay so if we email you now we can get on the vip list yes you can um, <laughs> Did but, I market it pretty well? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think you did. Um, but otherwise, we can look out any year, like around May, end of May is what we're looking for. Right. Yep. Yep. I would say a little more in the beginning of May, just because we have our schedule out um, come end of May. Um, so anytime in the spring, I would say to contact. Okay. Good deal. And if people, for some reason, don't have my information, they can just look it up on DNR and contact Black River Falls office. So, okay, that's good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Um, all right. So next up is a question from Jacob Sherba. So you can give him a hard time about. Oh, this. I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many people signed up for the lottery in this most recent hunting season? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure on that exact number. I know a few years ago we had 280,000. I believe it was down a little bit this year. I might be mistaken, so don't take me on that. Um, but I believe it was about 280,000. Dr. Kingstrom, have you heard anything on those numbers? <laughs> I think top year was 350. Thousand. Yeah, and right. And then it dropped 280, and then I think it was 210. Was yeah. The top year. Yeah, it's, it's dropped a little bit here. Um, I think just because people realize that it might be a smaller chance, but even if you put in for the lottery, like it still goes to our reintroduction efforts and everything. So that money is um, really well utilized and hopefully it'll start going up because we'll hopefully have more chances here um, with a herd growing. So keep putting in for it, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> buying your lottery ticket right. <laughs> gets a whole new meaning to the word lottery I think oh my gosh right yeah very cool um yeah. very cool okay next question is about you working for DNR so um how did you begin working for DNR and then also more broadly what do you think are the differences between zoologists and wildlife biologists oh no getting back into the school questions here okay no I started working for the DNR um I, you know, I had that internship um, after my junior year, my junior summer kind of thing. And I really enjoyed that because it was a lot of management um, and I wanted to work a little bit more in research. And so um, with that, I found really good opportunities with state agencies. And so that's why I started with Missouri. Uh, Missouri, I had a great, great hand at working on management as well as research, um, which was awesome. And then I ended up getting this job, which is a little bit closer to home. Um, and I really, I do enjoy working with the state state agency is just because there is a variety of things that you get to do. So yeah, and then I guess as a wildlife biologist, I mean, that kind of kind of speaks for it being able to do the research and the management. So you're working out in the field, but you're not just working with the animals, you're working with the environment as well. And so that's one of the main parts of being a biologist or an ecologist is that you're working with that environment. Um, and making it suitable for those species that you are um, trying to target it towards. So 
And that's why I enjoy it. You get to be outside all the time. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we we can tell. Yeah, yeah. So whether it's cold, raining, whatever it is, we'll I'll take it. So. So it was really your internship that pushed you towards the agency, and then um, it just ended up being something that you really felt suited for. Yeah, and you know, with my past research projects, I knew I really liked research, and I wanted to do that. Um, So then I knew I wanted to find like an internship or something working with management because at the time I hadn't had a lot of experience doing that um so then once I was able to do that I knew I liked both and working with the state agency you kind of get to have the best of both worlds there so sounds good sounds good um all right next up is uh what are the management population goals for each herd Right. So I'm not sure on the exact numbers. Um, I think just as long as they're growing at a specific rate um, that we're doing, we're doing good. So I'm not sure really. I know we have, we're revising the elk plan um, this year. So there might be some numbers that are thrown into there, um, but that's in the works right now. So from the past plan, I'm not positive on that, but I can find out if you would like. (laughs) Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really good question, and I, I, I know that there was a minimum number that they wanted in the Clam Lake herd before they would start hunting. Right, yeah. And then that's just closely looked at on an annual basis, but they did have a hard number that they were looking at for Clam Lake. Um, but overall population, you know, management goal, like, um, what what is the end goal? That's an interesting question. I, I don't know about that either. Right, and unless um, Dr. Hingstrom has an answer for that, I can ask our biologist because that one I actually haven't been asked either because usually um, I don't I don't really know if there is an end goal just because it's a population that we hope persists for future generations. So yeah, so you just want a stable population as right. much as there's a maximum number of individuals that you're looking for. Right. And we want them to be growing at a certain percentage and, you know, making sure there's uh, cow to bull ratios at certain, certain areas, whatever that needs to be. There's, so there's criteria that needs to be met every year. Um, but I wouldn't say there is necessarily an end goal for it. Okay. Because hopefully there doesn't have, like, there isn't an end goal, you know, hopefully they're going to keep going. So. <laughs> Do you have anything that you wanted to add about that, Scott, or is that? Um, you know, the, the exact numbers escape me, but I, I think that they were having a target of 350 in the Clam Lake herd, and 200 in the Jackson herd. Um, but as Chanel mentioned, they're working on a new elk management plan now. And so those numbers will be different very soon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Part of it is that uh, we have a, a human dominated landscape. And so I don't think we can have, expect to have an elk behind every tree in Wisconsin. <laughs> you know, it's a native species here. We want to have a viable herd, and uh, but but there's a limit as far as the human tolerance to elk, as far as vehicle collisions and, and the crop damage that that uh, Chanel has mentioned, and so it's it's a matter of trying to manage it at that both the biological and the social carrying capacity. Yeah, so try to find the balance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're starting to wind down, um, but we've got another question from Dan about, Mm -hmm. um, do you have to have an approval process for using the deterrents um, for hazing? And I'm assuming you mean the pyrotechnics and also maybe the um, drone? Right. Yeah. So there is a lot of paperwork and everything that goes into being able to use that. Um, I know Jennifer and Dr. Hingstrom have done a lot more paperwork and that kind of stuff on the drone. And um, I, I believe they, unless you can now, can't use them at nighttime or after a certain time. Um, pyrotechnics, we usually are able to use those whenever we need to. Um, but if it is private property, we obviously have to go through um, with our partners or whoever the landowner is, what we're doing, why we're doing it, um, as long as they're comfortable with louder noises. So there is, um, I wouldn't say it's an approval process necessarily for the pyrotechnics, Um, but there is a process that we do have to go through. So we can't just, we can't just run around cornfields or whatever and say, there's an elk here. So I'm going to 
shoot a pyrotechnic at it. <laughs> um, unless they're creating damage, there needs to be a reason for it. And um, obviously with private landowners, we can't just walk up on their fields whenever we want to. Um, so it's a lot of uh, working with different stakeholders and everything and um, just making sure everyone knows what's going on and when it's gonna happen. And so, yeah, so there's definitely um, a process to it. Okay. Good to know. That's good to know that you can't just go shooting off. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, we, we <laughs> usually don't tell people we can or whatever. We, I mean, it's just people would start calling up and being like, someone's shooting on my land or, you know, we get more issues um, if we didn't go through that whole process with everyone. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got our follow-up question from Dan about the euthanization question. And the question okay. is whether whether the animals are removed. Like, so when you euthanize an animal, you take it off the landscape or do you leave it? Nope, we take it off the landscape. So usually what's gonna happen is um, any animal, like any elk that's euthanized or let's say hit by a car or something, um, if we can get to them, we will take them and they'll come back to our walk-in freezer. We'll put them in the freezer. And then um, usually what we do is we take the OBEX and the CWD uh, lymph nodes. So the um, RPLNs that we take and we'll send those down to Madison to their health lab. Um, so that's usually, and we'll usually do that um, a couple at a time. So like a few weeks ago, I had to take three elk down to Madison. So those will get tested for CWD and uh, brainworm as well. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we don't ever leave them on the landscape unless, um, usually with the body, we take it to a landfill, an authorized landfill to get rid of that, so. Yeah, so I think that um, I saw Dan being upset about removing, <laughs> actually removing individual, or you're like, why, why would you do that? So it's only yeah. a few animals that you're really talking about doing. This yeah, behavior, and it gives you important health information. Right, exactly. It's not every single animal, because um, a lot of times uh, when we do have that animal that we have to euthanize, we want to figure out what happened. Sometimes it is brain worm where we did have an animal. Um, funny, quick story that in uh, the winter of last year, I saw an elk walk in, walking around in circles, drooped head, um, just everything was kind of wrong with him. And then he ended up dying actually a few months later of, you know, you could say natural causes, um, but we're thinking it's probably brain worm. So we were able to figure out where he was at uh, due to his GPS location on his collar. And for that reason, that elk got sent down to the lab because we want to figure out if that animal has brain worm, then if that animal has, you know, whatever disease that it could be spread um, and that we can kind of keep track of that too. So it's a lot of, it's not just trying to figure out the disease of that one animal. It's trying to keep the rest of the herd safe if it is an instance like that. Okay. And I think that kind of relates to um, Dan, what I'm presuming is your last question about how sustainable it is to take individuals out when they're suffering. So if you're trying to get the population to grow, right? Right. Um, is it sustainable to be removing those animals? But I think part of that has to do, like you said, with the safety of the herd overall. Yep. And then also um, probably just some ethical issues as well. Do you, do you leave an animal that is suffering that will likely die anyways? Right. And we obviously check all of our, um, we go over a checklist of everything and make sure this is the right bet. This is what we need to do. Um, so it's not just like, oh, we're just going to do this because, you know, whatever. We, we have a checklist and everything that we have to make sure, you know, we're following the right protocol and doing the right thing. Um, and like I said in the presentation earlier, when an elk breaks a leg, two legs, whatever it is, it's almost impossible for that animal to recover in the wild. And it will most likely be the first one predated on, um, which does, you know, help that predator prey interaction and everything. Um, but if it is something where the elk gets hit on the highway and it has two broken legs, but it's still alive, that's something we want to euthanize right away. Um, especially because it's a very big public area being on the interstate, um, we don't want to, you know, get crowds come in or anything like that. So, and that creates a lot more human issues too, because if we have a bunch of people, 
you know, stopping on a 70 mile an hour highway to look at this elk, um, that could create a lot of accidents. So there are a lot of human safety risks and everything that we do look into when um, we have to euthanize an animal. Yeah, good. That's a good answer. That's a hard, that's always a hard decision to have to make, I think. It is, it is. And it's something you never want to have to make. Um, but if it's for the better of the animal, then, you know, that's something that we do have to do. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunately part of, part of the job, but. Yeah, that's a hard, hard decision. So actually, it is. Um, we just had one more pop in. We're at the very end. Um, we've got a question about fences and vehicle collisions, but we've got one more follow up about um, injured animals. So maybe we can ask this question. Um, right. is, is there a rehabilitation option for any of these animals that are injured? Um, since the populations are growing, is there a way that you can rehab some of these animals? Right. So you know, I haven't actually been asked that question before, so I will, I, yeah, it's, it's another good one. You guys are hitting me with good <laughs> questions today, uh, but it is something I can look into. Um, a lot of the animals that we will rehab are like bald eagles, that kind of stuff. We'll take those. If they get in, injured, it becomes top priority. They go straight to a rehab um, and we do everything we can. But like I said, it kind of depends on what's going on with the elk. Um, like I said, the broken legs, which is usually the main issue uh, with elk, that's really, really hard to have an animal recover from that. Um, just because, you know, you're talking about putting a cast on an animal or trying to stabilize that. And um, I'm not sure if there are rehab options for elk. I, I haven't heard of it before, um, but I wouldn't say no to it. So it is something I can look into. Okay, that's a good question. I, I haven't yeah. thought of that one either. I think that's a good one. Yeah, that is a good one. Um, okay, our last question. Okay. <laughs> And I think we'll cut it off after this. Um, would the introduction of fences around interstates and wildlife bridges be a possible way to decrease vehicle collisions? So how extensively have you used that? Yes, so it would. We actually do have a fence up around the interstate right now. Um, the elk do find their way around that and unfortunately get into those collisions. Um, so a lot of what we do too, um, since we do have those GPS collars on the elk and we can see every 13 hours where they're at, we'll actually, so there's the interstate and then there's a bunch of woods and a fence line. Um, we'll actually go out and haze them. So we'll use pyrotechnics if they're getting too close to the highway, just so that we stop a collision so that none of that happens, no one gets hurt, um, no elk are harmed or anything. So that is um, a big thing that we will do is go out and haze. Um, if they are putting up a bigger fence, I'm not sure on that. Uh, they want The one they have is probably six foot high or so, but you know, elk can elk can get over that pretty easily. So mm -hmm. usually, um, like I said, we try to haze them out of the area. And a lot of times, the elk are actually more towards the Wazi Lake area, which is away from the highway a little bit. So um, once we start running into that issue, we kind of address it as fast as we can. And I imagine when you're doing hazing of any kind, you, you're very careful about which direction you're hazing animals. Yes, towards. yes, very much so, because the last thing we want to do is haze them towards the interstate and create a really big mess. So, yeah, that then that would, you know, be us getting a bunch of trucks and everyone to line up on the highway, trying to stop the elk, whatever it is. So we we make sure we're doing it in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good deal. Um, so I think that we've made our way through all of the um, questions. I'm really impressed at the, the number of things that came up. Um, if I have any students left here, I just want to remind you about your midterm and wish you good luck, tell you to study before you take that. And um, Chanel, I just want to thank you very much. If you want to, before you log off, I think you should just scroll through and see all the thanks and things that you got, because this was a super well. fun one. I will. Um, yeah, especially right in the middle of the semester. There's, you know, there's a lot going on and, and it's just it's a nice fun thing to get to be able to do. Um, yeah. So we're really, really happy to have you here.
Yeah. Um, so if thanks I everybody could, for, for coming. Maybe, Go ahead, Scott. If I could just express some appreciation to our audience, because uh, I did a quick count at some point in time, we had 66 participants on. And a half an hour after we were, we were supposed to close down, we still had 24 people <laughs> hanging in there. So mm -hmm. Chanel, it's a testament to your presentation. Um, we had some well, wildlife faculty involved. We also had some uh, wildlife alums out there. So a shout out to Jacob Sherba and Ben Tiefke and Eric Venata. These are some names I know Chanel knows. And it's, mm -hmm. it's really fun to see uh, some of our alumni that are getting involved with, with our seminar series as well. So. Chanel, thanks for uh, participating. You did a great job. It was really enjoyable. And I know the students were really into it as well. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I always love doing these presentations for UWSP. So look forward to them. <laughs> it was 79, actually, at the highest. Nice. 79, actually. 79 